Hi, I'm Garrett Martin, the games editor for Paste Magazine, and I'm here at the Sennheiser Paste Interactive Studio Lounge with uh, Brenda and John Romero, um, who are here talking about uh, game design. How are you guys doing? Good, thanks. Awesome. You having a good conference so far? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, you both have been in the industry for a, a long time. You're, you know, storied careers. How has the process of making a game changed uh, since you started out? <laughs> well, teams got big and then they got small again. Yeah. <laughs> more money was spent on them, more polygons. More poly, lots more polygons. Um, First pixels, then polygons, then lots of polygons, then less polygons. But the process of design itself hasn't really changed. You know, what are your constraints? You're trying to make something that's fun. And what are your constraints? And your, cons your constraints are always, you're always bounded by the machine you're on. Uh, or the money if it's you a, have. The money you have. And within that, you have to make something that's fun. Uh, so the process itself hasn't changed that much. Publisher expectations have in, in more polygons, way more polygons. Right. So speaking of publisher expectations, how has the process of selling video games changed since oh. you all got into Monetization the industry? is totally different, you know. Yeah. Um, well, you know what's funny? Microtransactions. Yeah, microtrans. Um, it, what's interesting is that the price of the game I first worked on was forty nine ninety five. And games are still pretty much forty nine ninety five, which is it's big retail games. Yeah. yeah, retail games, which is interesting. Although the cost of making them has gone gone up dramatically. Um, but now games are also really cheap on mobile. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So and nowadays, you know, with things like with Kickstarter and and now that that making a game on mobile is much more accessible, you know, to the one, two, three, four person sized group. Um, gaming, to me, developing is way closer to what it was like back in the 80s, actually, when you could just make a game and release it and you didn't have to worry about, you know, how am I going to get this on a console and, and having a team of a hundreds. You know, one person, you know, Notch, for instance, changed the world with Minecraft. Right. So, John, when you made Doom, how many people worked on Doom? There were six. And today a shooter like that would have how oh, many people working on well, it? Yeah. 150, 200, 250, something like that. Depends on it. Depends on what the production value is supposed to be like. If it's AAA, it's going to have that many people. Um, you know, it just depends on how much money the publisher wants to put into it, how much crazy art they want to, you know, put into it. Um, typically, it's def definitely tens of millions of dollars um, nowadays for a, I guess, a smaller shooter versus something that's like a huge, you know, Call of Duty kind of thing. Right. So when you're ever feeling down or ever worrying about life, do you pick yourself back up by saying, I'm the guy that made Doom? <laughs> I play Minecraft. <laughs> you know what's funny is he never, and I mean, I've known John since the 80s. He's, he's not the type of guy, honestly, to ever get down. I mean, he's, he's Teflon. Um, he's genuinely one of the most consistently happy people I know. Oh, well, that's uh, good. Yeah, and there's, there's, I don't really remember a moment when he was down. Yeah. No, I mean, he's just always thinking of the next game he's going to make. Making games, I mean, yeah. what's so down about that? Yeah. <laughs> Living the dream, kind of. So, yeah. Uh, you guys started Loot Drop together yeah. in 2010, right? Yeah. What's the current status of Loot Drop? We have our final game, I think, that yeah. we're releasing. Yeah, we'll be releasing one more game that has been in the works for quite a while, and then John and I are getting out of social games, okay. going, going back into traditional game development. Why are you leaving the social realm? Uh, we don't really like the nagging nature of social. Yeah. You know, playing games on Facebook to make money, have to nag people all the time, right. that's just not fun. I, I people on Facebook won't pay like 10, 20 bucks for a game, and then you know, do it that way. They they expect free play and then small, small transactions. And um, and to get that, you know, you have to really bug them a lot. Yeah, it's not... I think there was a time when making games, just like I've never made a whatever type of game it is. You know, there's, there's a tremendous intellectual interest in developing a game for a market that you've never developed for on a platform you've never developed. And so we've been there and seen it and done it, and we've released three games we're about to release. 
Wait, two. We've developed like three other games yeah. that haven't been released. And so we've got one one more that's coming out, but we just feel ready to move on and do something different now. What do you think you're going to be looking at next? Uh, can't, well, it's not going to say. Yeah, he we can. Have cool I plans. can tell you. Um, so all I got, I'm working with, uh, he has cool plans that he can't talk about. Um, I have a, I'm working on a series of my, the non-digital games I make, and I'm working at the University of Santa Cruz um, for the next year, just as their game designer in residence. Uh, and I teach a course in game design, but mostly I'm focused on making these non-digital games. And so that's what I'm doing, okay. which is wonderful. Yeah. How does that... Uh Personally, from like a self-fulfillment self, uh, standpoint, how does that work um, feel compared to uh, you know digital game work? Uh, it depends on the digital game. Yeah. Um, the last game that I released that was non-digital was a, a, a game called Preconception, um, and that in just in the, of all the games I've released in the last three years, that single game made me happier. And it's just, it's a one-of-a-kind game. I mean, literally, there is only one of them and only will ever be it's one really version. It's not a game either. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, it's more of an art game. Yeah, it's more of a concept uh, than it is a game. Um, anyway, but it's visible. It's a, you know, it's, it's a... It's all non-digital, all the pieces are there. I'm just making it sounding far more confusing than it actually is. <laughs> and it's incredibly fulfilling to make that. I mean, when I'm making those games, I am the publisher, I am the developer, you know, I make the calls. And to be able to create something that is 100% wholly yours, not having it derailed by budgets or the whim of marketing is phenomenally fulfilling. I don't think it gets but more fulfilling than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, your talk today, I wasn't able to make it, but uh, the uh, Euro Dreams of Game Design was a very interesting idea, I thought. What do you think uh, people can learn about game design from that documentary? Oh, jeez. Well, it's not just, not just game design, um, but I would, say, uh, I would say anybody who truly feels called to do something, if, if they have such an incredible passion for something, like John and I have been making games since we were kids. I mean, and I don't mean like 17, 18. By the time we were 17 or 18, we'd been making games for nearly a decade each. Um, and so, he's, Jiro in, in the documentary, I mean, he's been making sushi since he was, I think, 10. And he's 85 and he doesn't feel he's perfected it. And he just mm -hmm. says, you really need to devote yourself to your craft. Um, and John and I have, you know, and it's probably the only reason we're a great couple for each, because we're both ferociously devoted to games, and it's all we do, it's all we talk about, uh, it is our work, it's also our hobby, um, our friends are game people, uh, and so it's just, it's the pleasure for me, it's the pleasure of watching somebody immerse themselves fully in something they feel phenomenally passionate about. Uh, and I think anybody can take anything away from that, regardless of what their calling is. Okay. Well, um, thanks again for coming out to the Sennheiser Pace Interactive Studio Lounge, uh, Brenda and John Romero. Um, thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Take Have, it fun. Easy. Have fun. Have uh, fun. You too.